Okay, so let's make a start looking at forces, motion, and energy. Starting off, calculate an object's weight force. Uh, the equation we need is weight force is gravitational field strength uh, times by the mass, uh, commonly seen in the form W equals mg. So describe the impact of mass on a force's ability to change the motion of an object. So essentially, a larger mass gives an object a larger inertia. Now, there are a couple of other things you can do to give objects larger inertia that you get to much later, but for now, a uh, larger mass gives it a larger inertia. And a large inertia means it's harder to change the velocity of an object. Um, so if you think when you apply a force to a very hairy or heavy object, it's really difficult to accelerate. That's because it has large inertia. Described in terms of gravitational fields, how weight forces occur. So, what's happening is objects with mass have a gravitational field around them. The larger mass gives a stronger gravitational field. So, here we go, here's an object, and here's our representation of the gravitational field around it. So, if we put another mass into that field, let's say here, and their fields are overlapping, those objects will exert a weight force on each other. Uh, and so it's not just one object exerting a weight force on the other, both objects exert weight forces on each other, and they'd actually be equal in size. Okay, so state if three effects of a force can have on an object. So a force could cause the speed to change, it can cause direction to change, or it can cause shape to change. So we're going to look at two specific conditions here. So forces acting parallel to velocity will change only the speed, not the direction. Forces acting perpendicular to velocity only change the direction, not the speed. Okay, so state Hooke's law, including the equation that models it. So uh, the equation that models it says tension force is stiffness constant times extension, or F equals KX, or F equals K delta L. You'll see it in lots of different forms. So what actually is Hooke's law, however? So Hooke's law states that the tension force is directly proportional to the extension of an object up to the limit of proportionality. So this equation only works if you're below the limit of proportionality. So what do we mean by tension force? Well, tension force is the force that resists you stretching an object. So if you apply two forces to try and stretch an object, tension force is what resists that. Compression force is the same thing, but it resists you squashing an object. Okay. So let's look at a little bit more about Hooke's law. So we're going to look at an experiment to verify whether an object obeys Hooke's law and how we find the limit of proportionality so we know when we're allowed to apply f equals kx. So the experiment that we're going to do is very similar to this one. So we need a retort stand and a spring and a set of hanging masses. What we're going to do is we're going to hang masses on the spring and measure its extension. So some things we need to think about. We'd need G clamps to clamp the retort stand to the table to prevent it toppling over. Anytime you're stretching an object, there is a risk of it snapping. So you need to wear safety goggles while you're doing this experiment. So what we're going to do is the first thing you need to actually measure is the original length of the spring. On the diagram, it's labeled as equilibrium length. So now we need to do that before we apply any mass. Then what we do is, in this case, we're going to use masses from 100 grams to 700 grams. And we're going to measure the stretch length, or extended length, as it's sometimes called. What we're going to do then is plot a graph with weight force that we applied. So we're going to do mass times gravitational field strength to get that. So we're going to do weight force on the x-axis, extension on the y-axis. Extension would be stretch length minus the equilibrium length. And that will be on your y-axis. And if Hooke's law is obeyed, the graph's going to be a straight line through the origin. And the limit of proportionality is the point it stops being a straight line. So most materials will eventually will start curving, um, and that would be beyond the limit of proportionality and f equals kx would not be applied there. Okay, so state the equation to calculate average speed. Um, average speed is the distance you travel divided by the time it's taken. Uh, so there's our equation. So describe how to determine speed from a distance versus time graph. Well, speed is the gradient of a distance versus time graph or change in distance divided by change in time, if you like. So identify the difference between speed and velocity. So 
speed only has magnitude or size so we'd say speed is five meters per second speed is 20 miles per hour velocity has both magnitude and direction so it would be five meters per second north or 10 meters per second at 30 degrees you know some way of giving the direction of travel so that means that speed is a scalar and a velocity is a vector quantity These vectors have direction and magnitude Let's get just distance versus time graphs showing an object accelerating, an object at constant speed, object is decelerating. Uh, so here are those graphs. So increasing speed, you can see the gradient is increasing or it's getting steeper. Decreasing speed, you can see the gradient is decreasing or getting less steep. Constant speed is just a straight line graph. State the equation to calculate average acceleration. Uh, so it's change in speed divided by time, or you sometimes see that as delta V over T. Describe how to determine acceleration from a speed versus time graph. Well, it's the gradient of a speed versus time graph. Distance traveled would be the area under the speed versus time graph. And if you want to determine average speed from a distance versus time graph, speed versus time graph even, uh, we would find the area under the graph that gives you the distance traveled and then you divide the area by the time to determine average speed. Okay so sketch speed versus time graphs showing these different types of acceleration or deceleration. So let's have a look. So increasing acceleration would be shown by a graph with increasing gradient which you can see there in the sort of bluish color. Constant acceleration will be a straight line graph, that's in the red. Decreasing acceleration, now this is the one people often get confused about. So decreasing acceleration still means the object is getting faster because it's accelerating. But decreasing acceleration, you can see the gradient is decreasing over time. So it's still getting faster, but the rate at which its speed increases is decreasing. Whereas constant deceleration means uh, speed is decreasing and it's constant deceleration, so it's a straight line graph. Describe how the resultant force can be found for two forces acting in the same direction. Well, you just add them together. That's fairly straightforward. Two forces acting in opposite direction, you would find the difference between them, so you're subtracting them. Okay, so resultant force is useful because it blends into Newton's first law, which states that the velocity of an object will be constant if the resultant force acting on the object is zero. It doesn't mean the individual forces themselves are zero, it just means when you add together all the forces or subtract them, whatever you have to do, it's going to come up with zero. So describe the cause of friction. So friction is caused by surfaces of materials interlocking as they slide past one another, and that force will act parallel to the contact surfaces. So the energy transfer caused by friction is it will do work on the object to decrease its energy, and it does that by transferring thermal energy to the surrounding. Surround surroundings get hot, essentially. If we go through the same thing for drag, so drag or air resistance as you might know it as is caused by the collision of an object with particles of a liquid or gas which are lumped together and called fluids and it always acts in the opposite direction to a object's velocity so again drag you will do work to decrease the energy of an object and it will transfer it into thermal energy into the surroundings. So again, the surroundings get hot or the air particles surrounding the object will have more kinetic energy. You can think of it like that too. So if drag is a sort of variable force, so if you travel at higher speed, there'll be a larger drag force because you're colliding with more fluid particles every second. And if you have a larger, what we call frontal area, the area that's actually colliding with the particles, that will give you a drag, higher drag force as well. Because again, you're colliding with more fluid particles every second. Okay, so let's move on to have a look at moments or the turning effects of forces. So then first let's define what one is. So a moment is the force times the perpendicular distance to the pivot, sometimes known as a fulcrum as well. So that's often expressed for this equation, moment is force times perpendicular distance. Okay, so for an object to be considered in equilibrium, we need to know two things. We need to know the resultant force is equal to zero. And we should also see that the moment clockwise about the pivot is equal to the moment anti-clockwise about that same pivot. 
So if we find the moments of all the forces and add them together appropriately, moment clockwise should equal moment anti-clockwise. If those two conditions are met, that object is in equilibrium and it will keep doing exactly what it was doing before. So if it was stationary, it will stay stationary. If it was moving at constant speed, it will keep moving it at exact same constant speed. So describe how to find the center of mass of a 2D object. 2D objects are sometimes referred to as laminas. Uh, it's just the same thing. So essentially all you have to do is hang it from two different places and then draw vertical lines downwards from those places and where those lines intersect will give you the center of mass. So just a little thing here, the, the thing you can see hanging down with the object on the end of it is what we call a plumb line. That's what allows us to draw vertical down lines down from the pivot point. So the two factors that affect the stability of an object or how hard it is to topple. So base width, so a wider base makes an object more stable. And the other thing is center of mass height. A lower center of mass makes the object more stable. So these are things you come across fairly often. So to define mechanical work, often you often see it just called work, but we're talking about mechanical work here, and state the equation to calculate it. So work done is force measured in newtons times distance moved in the direction of the force measured in meters. Um, so that's often simplified to W equals FD. If work is done on an object, its energy must change. So it can either increase or decrease, but if we do work, its energy must change, and it must change by amount equal to that work done. That's what conservation of energy tells us. Okay, so state the equation to calculate change in gravitational potential energy of an object. So this is a specific case of doing work where we're doing work to increase the height of an object. So the change in the gravitational potential energy is equal to the mass times the gravitational field strength times the change in height. Or you could say that as it's the weight force times the distance moved parallel to the weight force. Uh, the same thing. Uh, equations to calculate power. Uh, we can either do work done divided by time. That's the most common form we see power in, it's the rate of work done. But you can also find it doing force times velocity. You see that as well, so uh, just to make you aware of that too. State the two equations used to calculate efficiency. So we can either do useful work done over the amount of input energy, or we can do useful power over the input power. We multiply them both by 100%, and that will give us an efficiency as a percentage. So finally, looking at the different ways of generating electricity and considering some advantages or disadvantages of them. So I've lumped the fossil fuels together. Um, this is energy from fossilized remains. So advantages of them, they're very reliable. So we can get that electricity from them anytime we want. And they are also pretty cheap, which is why electricity these days is quite cheap. Um, but they're non-renewable, so it will take thousands, if not millions of years to replace our reserves of them. And they emit CO2, which is contributing to global warming. Nuclear power uh, is reliable as well, and it doesn't emit CO2, which is pretty handy. Um, but again, once we've used nuclear, it's actually never coming back. And it's very, very expensive. You're looking at twen spending 20 billion pounds if you want a new nuclear power plant. Solar, um, it doesn't emit CO2. Great, it's renewable. Uh, so using sunlight doesn't mean, like it's always being replaced by the sun, so that's not an issue. It's unreliable, because it's not always sunny. So we get very variable power outputs from solar cells. And it's also very inefficient. They're about 15% efficiency, something like that. Um, we used to say that they're expensive, but the price is actually coming down quite a lot. So I don't think that's really true anymore. Wind power, uh, again, doesn't emit CO2. Again, it's renewable, like wind is always being produced. Uh, again, it's unreliable because you never know how windy it's going to be particularly accurately. And you can also consider the environmental damage of them, uh, especially to like birds and things like that. Tidal uh, is renewable, it doesn't emit CO2, um, and it's actually pretty reliable. We get two tides every day, uh, that's consistent, so it's, it gives us a good base load of power. Um, but tidal is very expensive, building a giant dam across an estuary or something is very expensive, and it can cause quite a lot of damage to ecosystems because, well, you're building in the sea, uh, so you can get damaged some habitats.
Wave power, again, doesn't emit CO2. Again, it's renewable. We don't run out of waves. They're always being produced. Um, but how wavy it is, it varies all the time, so it's not reliable. And again, you can do some habitat damage by putting equipment in the sea. Hydroelectric. Um, doesn't emit CO2, and it's renewable. You're getting a sort of a theme with these new kinds of energy that we use. Uh, but it's very expensive to build these giant dams, and you cause damage because you flood large areas of land, and you're going to disturb habitats. Geothermal, again, uh, doesn't emit CO2. You're just harnessing the heat from underground, um, and it's renewable. We're always producing heat. Uh, the earth, centre of the Earth is very, very hot. Um, it's very location dependent, so accessing geothermal power if you live in Iceland, brilliant. There's lots of uh, releases of it. In the UK, it's, you have to dig kilometres underground to access it, so um, it, you know it's very variable. And digging underground makes it very, very expensive. So if in the UK we want to use geothermal, it will be very, very expensive to do so. So we're digging down a long way, which is expensive. And that completes this force, motion and energy review.